Hello and welcome to Risky Talk, the podcast where we talk about risk and how to talk about risk. I'm your host, David Spiegelhalter, and in this, our very first episode, we're exploring how to communicate genetic risk. I do think we're going to be testing all children at birth, and I think we're going to be kicking ourselves that we didn't do it sooner. We know that most doctors, let alone other healthcare professionals, are very, very unequipped to to deal with genetic information. Just giving people the secondary finding, the unanticipated finding, is not the end of the story. The really important question that needs to be answered next is, well, what happens now? A few years ago, I sent off a little tube of saliva to one of the commercial genetic testing companies, and I learned a few interesting things. I've got a lower than average risk of developing coronary heart disease and Alzheimer's, and a higher risk of getting psoriasis and celiac disease. And I've got absolutely no idea what to do with this information. So my story illustrates how certain kinds of genetic testing is already widely available, at least to those who seek it out. But pretty soon it's going to be part of all our lives. In the US, the National Institutes of Health has recently embarked on a massive research program to sequence a million people's genomes. And here in the UK, the National Health Service is undergoing a major transformation, gearing up to integrate genetics into everyday medical care. And these are exciting developments, but they throw up serious challenges. Should we always share genetic information just because it's available? What do we do, for example, with distressing information about our future health that we can't do anything about? Do doctors and patients really understand genetics enough to use it effectively? And how can we best communicate genetic risk so that it's accessible and useful to everybody? To discuss all this, I'm joined by a group of people who have really studied these issues. Professor Robert Green joins us live from Harvard Medical School, where he is the director of the Genomes to People Research Program. He's led a series of major studies into the medical and psychological impact of sharing genetic information with patients. Robert, welcome to Risky Talk. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. Dr. Gemma Chandratilaka is the course director of the Genomic Medicine Program here at the University of Cambridge and is also responsible for training doctors and nurses throughout the East Midlands and East of England in genomics. Welcome, Gemma. Thanks, David. Dr. Saskia Sanderson is a psychologist based at University College London. Her work explores the psychological and behavioural effects of genomic sequencing, including what happens when you tell people their personal genetic risk scores for things like heart disease and obesity. Welcome, Saskia. Thanks, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here. Now, I've always found genetics incredibly complex. So, Gemma, can you start by giving us a quick overview of the main kinds of genetic tests that are currently used in healthcare? Okay, so we're really thinking about two areas of medicine. We're thinking about cancer and also rare disease. So in cancer, we actually test tumours and look for genetic changes to enable us to Um, predict what what would be the best treatment for that particular cancer. And in rare disease, um, we use genetic tests to make diagnosis for patients. So it's important to remember that one in 17 people in the population have a rare disease and 80% of those conditions are genetic. A lot of these conditions you won't have heard of. There are literally thousands of them. But some of the more common rare diseases that you might have heard of would be things like hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. So that's the condition that Angelina Jolie has. And that's where people who have a family history of breast or ovarian cancer might have their BRCA1 or 2 gene sequence. So that's the BRCA gene. Yeah, that's the BRCA gene. Another sort of more common rare disease would be something like cystic fibrosis. So we know in the Northern European population, about one in 25 people are carriers for that condition. So that's a relatively common rare disease. Um, but there are thousands and thousands of conditions that you know we haven't heard of, but that lots of people have. Robert, what would you like to add? Another distinction I like to make is uh, just the difference between indication-based testing and predispositional testing. Indication-based testing means there's a a patient in front of you, someone who's sick, who's got something, and you're using genetics to either make that diagnosis or to improve the treatment of them uh, to try to help them get better. Uh, Predispositional 
testing or, or screening, if you will, is, is really different. There we're trying to understand the risk involved in the future. And we are uh, actually trying to use that in order to decide whether to take action that will then mitigate that risk uh, going forward. Yep, that's a helpful distinction. Using genetics to understand existing health problems versus using genetics to estimate the risks of future problems. Yeah, and thinking about future risks brings us to a relatively new method that isn't being used much in healthcare yet, but almost certainly will be in the near future. And that's polygenic risk scores. Saskia, can you explain those? Yes, that's right. So polygenic means, poly means many genic genes. So in this case, whereas what Gemma was talking about was genetic testing for a single rare variant in your DNA that can have a, a really significant and large impact on your disease risk or incidence. In the case of polygenic risk scores, what you're talking about is um, looking at the combined effects of many, many common DNA variants in your genome. So you're talking about creating scores using dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of these common variants in your DNA that each one of them individually has just a very small impact on your risk of, say, heart disease or uh, breast cancer uh, or Alzheimer's disease. But when you combine them all together, you can find those people that are really at the top 5% of risk, who are really at very high risk of developing these complex conditions in the future. Okay, so you can just tell people they're at high risk or low risk, but you can't say, that, oh, it's that gene that did it. No, what you'd be doing is telling them that on the basis of many, many gene variants in many, many genes across the whole of their genome, their complete set of DNA, uh, based on that, they're, they're at high risk. Mm, okay. How might these polygenic risk scores be used in the future? Yeah, so there are uh, two main ways. So the first way is to use polygenic risk scores alongside other known risk factors, things like age, gender, smoking, uh, BMI, uh, as well as clinical indicators, cholesterol and so on, to identify people who are at very high risk of something like heart disease and therefore who need a, a preventative treatment. So it's to start taking a statin to reduce their cholesterol or prevent their cholesterol increasing over time. So that's the first way. The second way a polygenic risk score might be used is to improve the way that we uh, offer something like the existing breast cancer screening program. So currently women are offered breast cancer screening uh, based on their age and gender. <laughs> However, we know that there are people in the population who are also at very high genetic risk and those who are at lower genetic risk. And so uh, one way that's predicted and that people are looking into using this kind of polygenic information is to find those women who maybe need to start screening actually earlier than the current national standard. And maybe even those women who are at lower risk and can put off screening, which comes with its own risks, until a later age. Right, so we've talked through the different kinds of genetic information that we're communicating. Let's pull back and ask what might sound like an obvious question. Why, why are we sharing this kind of information in the first place? What are we trying to achieve? Robert, can I come to you on this? Sure, David. I think that the reason we're doing this is because genetic information is part of the blueprint of life. And it is very much part of the blueprint of almost all diseases that we face in one form or another, as well as part of the blueprint of how we treat those diseases with different pharmacological agents. And so the more we understand genetics, although it's not going to give us the answer to everything, the better we're going to be able to understand issues around human disease and human treatment of disease. And I think where this is really heading is the idea that Instead of always reacting to sick people, we are going to eventually be in a position to predict and prevent disease more fully, which is, I think, where we'd all like to see medicine go. So I, I think that's the big picture here. But there's many jumps and starts along the way. And so uh, this issue of how we think about genomics, how we talk about genomics, how we communicate genomics has been just utterly fascinating over the last few years as it has become much less expensive, much more available to both the lay public and within the medical establishment. Can I ask more about this idea of, of why is this might be this be useful for an individual to get this information? Well, it's unequivocally useful right now 
if you have a rare condition that nobody understands or nobody knows how to diagnose. That's that's sort of unquestionable. Right now, we test people with rare conditions and mysterious conditions all the time and find the molecular explanation for those diseases. That's sort of diagnostic molecular testing. And as Gemma pointed out, it's unequivocally useful right now to test tumor tissue and look at the genetics of cancer tumor tissue and try to uh, actually personalize or customize the right drug for that tumor. So those are two areas that I don't think there's any debate about. There's still a little debate about how useful and how quickly will it be useful for genomics to be part of everyone's life. David, you, you, you sort of questioned what you learned from some of the testing you did, but at a larger societal level, there's a question of what can everybody learn from their genomics, particularly as genomics gets better and better. But what about giving people information that actually they can't do anything about? Um, is that still always valuable? Well, Saskia might want to weigh in on this uh, because she and I have been looking at this in many different ways together. But I personally don't think there is such a thing as information you can't do anything about. I think that's a false dichotomy. Every piece of information is useful. It might not be in useful for a pill or an x-ray or a preventive strategy, but it might be useful for you planning your life or getting involved in a clinical trial or um, supporting a particular disease category through advocacy. Mm. Saskia, what do you feel about that? So in terms of giving people information they can't do anything about, whether that is useful, valuable, positive for any given individual is actually partly up to the individual. So what we've seen in our research is essentially that people that feel that they wouldn't be able to cope with a per certain type of result, um, something that they would find very upsetting, perhaps this isn't the right time of life for them, and so on, actually they opt out often of the studies, of the test, and so on. And so actually this is why one of the reasons why informed choice and supporting people to make informed decisions about whether they have genetic testing, genome sequencing is so important because they often they know what's best for them. And if they don't want to know, if they think it's not right for them, then they can choose not to go down this path at this moment in time in their life. So do we know about the effect of giving people this information? You know, I've heard of this thing called the, the jelly donut effect. If you, if you tell people they're at low risk of obesity, maybe they'll go out and start stuffing themselves and not care at all about what they eat. And, you know, and, and similarly, if you tell people they're at, high risk of getting Alzheimer's, are they going to get really anxious about it? That's right. So so another way of thinking about the jelly donut uh, or the jam donut uh, effect is false reassurance. You know, people thinking, right, it's not in my genes. It's safe for me to eat and drink and smoke as much as I want and whatever I want, right? And and actually, in all the research we've done so far, we've seen no evidence of that at all. So again, this comes down to how you communicate the information. Actually, if you do a good job of communicating this to people, first of all, then they shouldn't respond like that because it's not true. It's obviously a disease is much more complex than that. Um, and so what we're looking at it in uh, studies where we're looking at the behavioral impact, the impact of genetic risk information on diet and exercise and smoking and so on, is we're looking at what they're eating, how much they're exercising, how much they're smoking before and after they get this type of information. So then you can see, are people uh, maybe quitting smoking or eating more healthily after they get high genetic risk information? And conversely, if they get low genetic risk information, are they actually smoking more, eating more, eating more unhealthily? And you don't see that. So no big you know, behavioral impact of, of, of providing this information. In terms of lifestyle behaviors okay, okay. in either direction. Yeah. Well, what about, Robert, what about anxiety? If, you know, if I'd got you know, my little you know, genetic test being told I was at very high risk of, of Alzheimer's, I'm not quite sure how I'd feel about that. You know, what, what, how, do, how, how do people respond to that, that kind of information? You know, David, one of the ways in which genetic testing got started in this last few decades was with a single disease, Huntington disease, a horrible, horrible midlife degenerative neurologic disease. And when they could identify the, the DNA change that caused it, and you had that change, it was virtually 100% that you would get the disease. From that and from other sort of narratives around DNA and genetics, 
I think the general public got a sense of determinism, a sense that having a DNA change in a particular direction meant you were definitely going to get that disease. And in that context, DNA information could be pretty scary. But um, what our research has found, and, and, and many others as well at this point, is that for almost everything else in genetics, that is not true. It is simply not true that people learning genetic risk information experience catastrophic anxiety, psychological distress, or any other serious psychological damage. What we've found, indeed, what we've shown in randomized trials using genetic risk for an untreatable disease, Alzheimer's disease, is that people manage the information very well. And I think it's exactly what Saskia said. It's that people do a quick self-assessment of whether or not they're the kind of person who can tolerate this information, whether they're the kind of person who's an information seeker, and if they sort of assess that they are, they may sign up for this kind of study or this kind of information. If they assess that they are not, then they don't. So people are self-selecting, and the ones who self-select to learn this information appear to do remarkably well with it. Now, that's not to say that genetic risk information can't be upsetting, particularly temporarily. If you learned you were at increased risk for cancer, if you learned you were at increased risk for heart disease, you might get upset, you might struggle with that information, and people do. But uh, one of the things I and many others have argued against is let's not exceptionalize genomic information. Let's, let's really treat it the way we treat other types of risk information in the practice of medicine. Okay, but if these uh, risk scores or whatever start getting rolled out within our National Health Service, um, you know, to a much wider group of people, um, do we think that, that people might respond differently in terms of being told they've got a, a really quite a substantial increased risk of cancer? I think one of the um, big things that we need to consider here is how many results people are getting simultaneously. So as Robert said, if somebody's considering a genetic testing for Alzheimer's disease, they can make a decision, an informed decision, is this right for me? Is this the kind of information that I want to learn about myself? As we move more towards the perhaps whole genome sequencing um, and people having the possibility of getting all sorts of different results arising from the sequencing, uh, including you know, heart disease risk, yes, Alzheimer's risk, but also, and so results based on polygenic risk scores, but also potentially rare variants that actually have a very significant impact on, say, risk of sudden cardiac death or breast cancer, et cetera. Um, then actually that decision-making process becomes much harder. Now, how do you make that decision? Because actually you can't uh, make, uh, it's very difficult to predict what's going to come out for you. You might find that you're at high risk of cancer, but it might be Alzheimer's. It might be something that you've not considered. Uh, and that is something that we have seen in our early research, um, uh, looking at the impact of genome sequencing on it, ostensibly healthy individuals, where for the most part, as Robert said, most people absolutely fine with the process, fine with the results, fine with the outcomes, because they all chose to go in. Because they're all volunteers, but they're that's going to change if we start right. testing absolutely. children or whatever. And, yes, that's right. And even in that case, though, even in the case of volunteers, you still have the, uh, we still have seen individual cases where somebody, a young man in one case uh, in his 20s was uh, told to one of our studies that he would, uh, a rare variant uh, in a gene associated with sudden cardiac death had been identified for him. Um, and uh, this was very distressing to him to learn, particularly at this stage of life, early in life. Um, and actually that did create considerable anxiety, distress, prompted a number of clinical um, investigations and so on. Um, and, uh, and so we do have to take that seriously. It's a minority of cases, but it's going to come up and we do have to bear that in mind. We've talked a bit about whether people can actually do something in response to the genetic information. Um, but this seems really important when it comes to what are called secondary findings. You know, if people are being tested for one thing, but then actually go through a whole panel and just find stuff that you weren't really looking for. Um, you know, uh, Robert, how, how would you recommend that's, that's dealt with? Well, David, I'm actually moving toward the term unanticipated findings because it covers not only that situation where you're testing someone and you have the opportunity to find things 
that were not indicated for in that testing. So, for example, you've got someone with a heart problem, and in the course of testing their DNA, you discover that they have a cancer predisposition. But also the huge numbers of people who are being genetically tested for research and who are beginning to ask the question, hey, are you finding anything that could be useful to my health? And if you are, are you going to give it back to me? I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon because hundreds of thousands of individuals are being sequenced worldwide as a part of research. So I think we're transitioning from a moment where unanticipated genomic findings were um, not really expected to a position where they are going to be expected because they are relevant to people's health. And that's a very interesting transition that's going on. Uh, just ask yourself, if you were in a research project, which you, you said you were, and there was a discovery in your genome that could tell you you're at increased risk for cancer or sudden cardiac death, would you want to be told? I, About 90% of people say yes. Yeah, I ticked the box. I haven't heard anything yet, but I ticked the box that I wanted to be told. So there's been a lot of um, controversy around this. There's been a lot of debate, but I I do think that um, some of the objections have been overstated because people want this. We can give it to them. And there's pretty good evidence, not definitive, but pretty good evidence that it benefits their health. One of the important things to add to that is that there is the result itself and then there is what happens next. Now, just giving people the secondary finding, the unanticipated finding, is not the end of the story. We found a BRCA1 mutation variant in your DNA. The really important question that needs to be answered next is, what, well, what happens now? And so when we're, we're thinking about delivering this in a clinical service, offering this clinically or commercially, always what we've got to remember is that this is half of the picture. The second half of the picture is, what can I do? What do I do now to reduce my risk? And that may be increased screening, it, frequency of screening. It may be taking a medication. It may be um, even risk reducing surgery. Uh, and so those are all really important things to bear in mind. But this brings me to the idea of how people are going to hear about this. I mean, the, the, the medical profession are going to be uh, of, of various types, going to be giving people this kind of information. Um, are they trained to do that, Gemma? Uh, well, the short answer is no. <laughs> so, so you know, from work that we've done um, from the literature as well, we know that most doctors, let alone other healthcare professionals, such as nurses and pharmacists, are very, very unequipped to, to deal with genetic information. Um, they don't receive very much training in genetics. And that, that training that they do receive, they don't really seem to recall particularly well because they're not using it on a daily basis. Um, and so we are faced with this situation where we have the potential to be rolling out this technology quite widely into a, a, a workforce that is not particularly more prepared than the general population for that information. Robert, Robert, I think you've done a, a, a program called uh, MedSeq where you, where you do train doctors. And how, how does that work? And does it work? Yes, we did a study called MedSeq in which we actually attempted to bring that information to primary care doctors without any kind of learned intermediary, without a geneticist or genetic counselor. Obviously, they were primary care doctors who volunteered because they were part of the experiment. They were in an academic center, so they weren't entirely representative. But the experiment did suggest that if they were a little bit motivated, they could learn how to read genetic reports in a surprisingly short period of time, like four to six hours of training, and talk to their patients in very sophisticated ways about the results. And what this hinted at, it's far from proven, but what this hinted at is that you don't really have to convert the entire medical workforce into genetically sophisticated practitioners. You might be able to give them some tools and let them take care of a lot of the basic genetic risk disclosures uh, that we have not really conceptualized they could do. And then you could use your genetically sophisticated providers to do more complicated things. So that was some of the, some of the suggestion from our MedSeq project. Gemma, how, how, how does it gone trying to teach local doctors about this? 
so I think the um, when we're thinking about training doctors and 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 other healthcare professionals, nurses, etc., in in genetics and genomics, the the sort of their anxieties fall into two areas. One is um, sort of around the technical aspects of the test, um, because the technology has been developing quickly and there are lots of different types of genetic tests that are available, you can often find that doctors might be quite unsure as to which test is the right test to order in a particular situation. They feel unsure about explaining that test to their patients. They also feel some anxiety around these sort of psychosocial aspects of the test. Um, doctors are used to thinking about their particular patient. And obviously, because genetics is uh, in genetics, the unit of care really is the family as opposed to just the individual person. This brings up issues of talking amongst families, um, risk for other family members. And so that's an area that people are not as used to talking about with patients. Um, and so there can be some anxiety around that. Um more recently, sort of the anxieties around big data, um, data storage, data security, et cetera, are also sort of popping up as as as, as um, among from the healthcare professionals that we speak with. So as we as we're rolling out more and more genetic testing and, and genomic testing, you know, when we're thinking about the the healthcare workforce, we have to sort of ask ourselves, you know, to what extent do we need to upskill that workforce in genetics and genomics? And and how feasible is it to do that? So, you know, I think it's it's clear that we could get people up to speed within a re relatively small time, but we're thinking about lots and lots of people um, and a very limited amount of professionals in the system that actually understand genetics and genomics. So how do we do that? Um, one way of doing that is to try and use our skilled professionals to teach our um, our non-specialist um, clinicians. But another way to do that is to think about how we're conveying the information to those non-specialist clinicians. And are we doing that in a way that is clear and actionable for them? Exactly. So so actually the, for, the form of the communication is absolutely vital. Absolutely. So, I mean... The, the, one fundamental part of communication, of course, is, is actually just listening and listening to and understanding the experience of the people you are trying to communicate with. And with this in mind, we're going to play an excerpt from an interview we pre-recorded with Gillian Hastings Ward. Gillian leads the patient representatives in the 100,000 Genomes Project. And this is a major NHS research program, which has involved sequencing 100,000 whole genomes with the, with the initial goal of finding genetic explanations for rare diseases. So here's Gillian. Hello, I'm Gillian Hastings Ward, and I'm the chair of the participant panel at Genomics England. We've been working for a few years now to oversee what happens to the data that's been collected about us in the 100,000 Genomes Project. Well, we're very thankful to the 100,000 Genomes Project because it's been able to find a diagnosis for my son who is severely disabled. And by the time he was 18 months, we'd had all the tests possible at the time and nobody seemed to know why he was epileptic or what the cause of his visual impairment was. So we were really pleased to be offered the chance to join this project in 2015. And it's been fantastic. We've um, we got a result for him. And that enabled us to find a whole network of people around the world who have similar problems. And now we're getting into a space where we can work quite collaboratively with parents, researchers, clinicians and others to actually start really building a patient-led research network around the world, which is going to bring great gains for us in the future. About one in four patients who are on the 100,000 Genomes Project are getting a positive diagnosis through it, and that is great news for them. It means that they at least have the name of the gene which is causing their troubles, and that certainly means that they have a, 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 a key into this next world. It's certainly not the answer for everybody, and even if you do get a genetic diagnosis, some of the genes that are being discovered at the moment are still so poorly understood that, in fact, it doesn't necessarily take you much further towards prognosis, but it does begin the journey of at least finding other people in the same boat as you, and that in itself is immensely valuable. So the, the panel itself is made up of up to 30 people who are actually participating or the primary carers for participants in the 100,000 Genomes Project. So um, we have um, people who have rare conditions, we have people who have specific forms of cancer that the project was looking at, and we have parents and carers of people who have these conditions. And that direct experience of being there in the interview room when we give consent to give our whole genomes for research purposes, 
has been very helpful in making us quite a credible voice because we understand directly how it feels to go through this process. And that was the sort of advice that Genomics England were looking to hear when they were analysing for their own purposes how well they felt it was going and also um, wanting to identify things that they could do to improve. So I think we've been quite a credible voice there. And I think as time has gone by, we have been very pleased how seriously they seem to have taken the concerns that we may raise. And there have been a couple of occasions where things have changed as a result of that. And I'm really pleased that they are listening. My own son was a medical mystery. So uh, he was recruited because they, we wanted to find out which gene was the root of his problems. And we heard that he had a, a variant on the gene called GRIN1, which is one of seven GRIN genes that operate um, all over the body, but particularly have an impact in the brain. But we'd never heard of it before, of course. The, no one, you know, it's, it's all cutting edge science. I think the first papers that were ever published about GRIN disorders only came out in about 2013, 2014. So, you know, he is as old as the science around this, which is quite an exciting thought. Um, so when we were given our diagnosis, I felt very much at that stage that we'd been trying to fill in a jigsaw over the years and our jigsaw now had all the pieces, but the picture on it was still a big fuzzy hole because no one really could tell me what it meant for his future. But at least all the pieces were in place and that was a good start. We've put together a paper of recommendations which talk about the ways that we feel work best when trying to communicate results of tests like this to participants. It's really important to have a headline that you can understand without knowing a huge amount about the science, but it's also important to have the details of what that diagnostic journey has been and the different genes that have been looked at and which one or two have been identified as pathogenic. And very specifically, what the spelling mistake actually is, so that if you are in a position to want to take that information forward, to share it with another professional or to share it with other researchers, then you've got that to hand because that itself is going to be the key towards doing better research for a wide variety of quite poorly understood gene diagnoses at the moment. So that tiered approach is really quite helpful, I think. So you've got the user-friendly headline, but then there's a scope for people who know more about what they're looking at to dig down into the details and really get right down to the individual misspellings. And for us, from the personal experience of the participant panel at least, we very much welcome the opportunity to speak directly to the referring clinician. We wanted either face-to-face -face contact or telephone contact. It's much easier if you have the opportunity to ask questions that occur to you right there and then, if you've got a person there to talk to. But also it was useful to have a um, contact details for somebody who you could contact later on when something else occurred because it, you know, no matter what kind of news this is, whether it's great news, whether it's terrible news, whether it's just overwhelming news, you're probably going to think over the following days and weeks of other questions that you wish you'd asked at the time. And having an opportunity to get in touch with somebody at that stage is really important, we feel, because then that really helps you understand your diagnosis or your lack thereof in much more detail and helps you understand where you need to look next for, for further help if need be. Well, it sounds like the 100,000 Genomes Project have done a pretty good job at listening to their participants. I should say I, I, I'm actually a participant in that project. Um, Gillian ended with the point that it's important to have a clinician to talk to, to understand a diagnosis and be able to ask follow-up questions. I mean, that seems very reasonable. But, but Gemma, you know, is this practically uh, feasible? Could this be rolled out? Yeah, I mean, the patient should be talking with a clinician about the results of a genetic test. Um, which clinician they talk to is, you know, is, is sort of what's in question. And it's um, important that the clinician that's talking with the patient is able to answer the patient's questions about that genetic test. I mean, that brings us on to the next thing, of course, is, you know, how do we communicate that risk? Um, how can it best be done so that people do understand you know, what it means? Because, as you said, you know, often the um, if it's being uh, being done by perhaps a general practitioner or whatever, then they, you know, they're not an expert in this field. So, Gemma, you, you know, you've got a background as a genetic counsellor. What have you learned about effective communication? Well, I think as genetic counsellors, genetic counsellors are called genetic counsellors for a reason. They're not called genetic teachers or genetic trainers. Their job is not to just teach genetics to patients. Their job is to work with patients and, and have effective communication, build rapport such that people can make sense of genetic test results in the context of their lives to help them make their own decisions about what 
what those results mean for them. So it's important that genetic counselors, you know, work with their patients to to understand their patients' values. Um, and that's really how how best to under, help them understand the information in in their own context. And being able to understand what the information means for you in your context is the best way of making it actionable for you. But but now as as this area grows, uh, we can't we have just haven't got enough genetic counsellors to do all this work. I know you've been working on actually redesigning the genetic reports mm. so that they're a lot clearer. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so if you don't have a genetic counsellor to explain it to you, that doesn't mean that we can't communicate genetic information effectively. So if we want our genetic tests to be used appropriately, we should engage with our user base. So that would be non-specialist clinicians and patients and the public in order to figure out how best to communicate that information. So that's what really what we did when we were designing genetic test reports. We took a user-centered design. We worked with patients who have rare disease. We worked with um, the public and we worked with non-specialist healthcare pro- professionals and we really asked them a lot about what they needed to see in a report in order to make it useful to them and that worked so how do you tell if something works <laughs> i'm a scientist so so where's the evidence so what we did is we um devised an experiment where we um showed our newly designed user-centered reports to um one group of the public and we showed our um, current genetic test report on the same condition to another group of the public. And then we measured how effective the communication of the information in, the re- in those reports was. We were very pleased to find uh, that, that the reports that we had um, designed uh, using our user input were more effective at communicating that genetic information. Um, people felt that they knew much more clearly what they could do with that information how therefore making those reports more actionable than the reports that are currently being used in in practice yeah robert robert yeah i I believe you created a a, a simple one-page summary um as uh, part of your MedSeq study i mean how did you go about doing that and um and 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 what was the the effect of doing that yes we sort of thought about the way medicine conveys reports in other highly technical matters like an x-ray report or a clinical chemistry report And in those situations, we don't ask the provider to become a radiologist or to become a chemist. We simply put the information in a form that they can understand and then use with the patient. So we tried to do that with genomic information. We had a couple of categories, a category for monogenic risk, a category for recessive carrier states, a category for polygenic risk, and a category for pharmacogenomic risk variants. And so we divided that page into four sections and put a little very simple message, you know, something was present or something was absent and uh, what it and described what it was. Now, there was more to the report. If you wanted to, you could look at the back pages and you could go into depth. But this gave the provider a sense of control, a sense of familiarity, because this is how other reports come to a typical provider. And they were able to work off of that and show um, pretty good understanding and pretty good communication of these complicated uh, concepts to their patients. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a statistician, so I suppose I like numbers. I like to know how big the risk is and and, and so on. Um, maybe not everyone likes numbers so much. Saskia, when you're communicating things like polygenic risk scores, which give you an indicate an increased risk, uh, do you use numbers? And is there a best practice for doing this? Yes, there is best practice for, for communicating risk. Um, and that includes we should always be um, uh, providing people with the absolute risk of, of them getting the, this condition. So that means, you know, your risk of developing heart disease in the next 10 years is 10 out of 100 or 10 percent um, uh, rather than and, and then to compare that to what the average person of that age and, and uh, gender's risk is. And then in, in addition to the numbers that may be presented verbally uh, or written down or both, then of course we need to think about how we present that information graphically, visually. Um, And there again, there is best practice for that. Bar charts are not ideal because the scale, it can be all over the place. Um, And so one of the ways in which we do this is to use these 100 people icon, uh, 100 people figures, where you can see out of 100 people like you, we would expect 20 to get 
heart disease. I, yeah, I, I was in, when I did the uh, commercial test, you know, it was giving me these relative risks, 20% increase, and it was giving me the absolute risks for the ones they were confident about. But it wasn't giving me 100 little... I love the little icon arrays. I wanted to see 100 little people, but it wasn't giving me that, which I, I thought was a shame. No, well, I mean, I've also seen this done in, you know, the sort of the curvy graphs, the line graphs, which I actually think are, they give the most amount of information, um, uh, but they but they are probably not the best way to communicate with members of the general public um, about their risk. Have, have, have you checked how well people do understand things like those icon arrays? Yes, we've done some research around that in when we were um, communicating uh, uh, in some of our early work on genetic risk for lung cancer. We looked at people, at how people were responding to that. And absolutely, based on the different ways in which we gave them the information, um, we certainly observed that uh, the, the most effective way was the 100 people icon figures. So using numbers and, and graphics using and, the and words as well. That's yeah. right. Robert, what, what techniques do you use if you want to share genetic risk using numbers? Well, first, I'd like to maybe present an alternative point of view to the one Saskia just mentioned. It has been a tradition in genetics that we do try to convey numbers. And I think that arose out of possibly reproductive genetics, where if one parent was carrying a recessive trait and another parent was carrying a recessive trait, there was this true uh, one in four chance that the child would have a devastating genetic condition. And a lot of numbers kind of, and attention to numbers and attention to statistics and communication about numbers became part and parcel of genetic counseling and of our conception of how to kind of present genetic information. But lately I've been wondering if it really doesn't need to be that way. You know, in, in the rest of medicine, when you come into your provider and you're a smoker, your provider doesn't say to you, you know, let's nail down that your smoking increases your risk of cancer by 3.7 odds ratio and your risk of heart disease by 2.4. Same thing with your cholesterol level, same thing with pretty much any risk. In fact, your provider brings it down to a very human level with you and says, look, you've got an increased risk of this stuff. Let's see what we should do, want to do, can do. Um, can afford to do in terms of time and side effects to try to mitigate that risk. And I think genomics, almost all of genomics, is going to move in that direction. I don't think it really matters whether we talk to people about specific numbers, except in a few circumstances. Um, and so I think we're going to find people with a cancer predisposition mutation, and we're going to say, look, you're at increased risk for a certain kind of cancer. Here are some of the options for surveillance. I see uh, surveillance. I see that Saskia may be objecting. Okay, then let's hear from the other two members of the panel on this before I weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> so I hear what Robert's saying. I think that um, we do, however, use uh, risk numbers in uh, in healthcare. So, for example, uh, if you are over the age of forty uh, in the UK, you may have had an NHS health check, and within that, the GP, your GP, may have used something called QRISC three, which is a a cardiovascular disease risk assessment tool, a heart disease risk assessment tool. Now, they're plugging in a number of different risk factors, yes, smoking, BMI, body weight, age, um, and so on. And then out of that is coming a number. Now, what I'd agree with is that perhaps that number, the exact details of that number, maybe uh, don't matter quite so much as what that number means. But you do have to know that number in order to make a decision about what to do next. Yes, it's a risk estimate. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. And that is very important when it comes to polygenic risk scores. There's actually more uncertainty around polygenic risk scores than around other um, single gene variant test results. Um, but, uh, but even acknowledging that, that number matters. So to give you an example, if you um, are judged based on the QRISC-3, based on the heart disease risk assessment that your GP might do, they will come out with a number that says your risk of developing heart disease over the next 10 years is 3%, 3 out of 100. Uh, or it will come out as maybe your risk is 20%, 20 out of 100. Now, if it's 20, your GP is now going to sit down and have a very serious conversation with you about two things. They're going to suggest that you consider changing your lifestyle, diet, exercise, smoking, alcohol. They're also going to have a discussion with you about whether starting a statin is right for you. Now, that 
the, what matters there is that the number has tipped you over the 10% threshold, which is what their, um, uh, uh, the cutoff currently is clinically. So I would say the number matters, uh, but ultimately it's maybe what risk category that puts you into is what subsequently matters. The other thing just to say is that I think uh, a lot of people do prefer GIST information and that's fine. I wanna know, doctor tell me, am I, uh, am I at high, really high risk? Do I need to worry? But that doesn't mean that the number doesn't matter. Gemma. Yeah, I mean, I think we we actually tested this. So these are this is questions that came up in our study. So when people had had um, that the scenario was that if somebody had had a, a screening test for cystic fibrosis and had tested negative, that didn't eliminate their risk of being a carrier for cystic fibrosis. Um, it lowered their risk of being a carrier for cystic fibrosis because of the test that was being done. So there was a residual risk. So when we tried to explain this residual risk, we played around with different ways of doing that. And we, first of all, stated the most, what we thought was the most simple way of explaining that. And we said, you're at low risk of having a child with cystic fibrosis. I think we all felt low was appropriate. Um, but people wanted a number. They, they would say, it would be nice to have a number. And I think that this really just comes from the fact that people are different. Some people really want to know specific pieces of information and some people really want to know the gist or be told what to do. And I think that that's, you know, our perception, there's also a lot of variation from individual to individual in what in our perception of risk. So, you know, for some people, 1% chance of having a bad thing happen is a very high risk and for other people, it's a very low risk. So words like high and low without being without backing them up with any actual quantification or um or, or sort of a display option like an icon array um you know it's, it's difficult and i think that you know from a genetic ca counseling practice we know that we know that certain people will want to drill down on the specifics of numbers but also you can't take it for granted that people are hearing the words high and low in the way that you think they are um and so it's important to explore different ways of, of communicating the information so that people truly um, can can see how that information feels to them. Yes, there are there are two interesting examples that follow on from this. I think so. Uh, so one example is when women uh, in this country have a, a test for Down syndrome in pregnancy, if they choose to do so, then they do get a number. They do get a number attached to that. Now, actually, how women then respond to that varies considerably. Um, and so again the number matters is communicated and does matter i well i, I suppose I, I i'm hardly a random member of the public but when, when i got when i looked at my genetic risk report you know I, there was a whole page of things i had an increased risk for some of which were completely terrifying but actually you know i did look at the absolute risks to see which ones seemed to make any difference okay we're coming to the end now this fantastic discussion we've talked about the effects of sharing genetic information we've talked about how to do it well how numbers can be useful or with some slight differences of opinion, the crucial importance of listening to patients and healthcare users. So now I want to ask about the future. Where's all this going in the next 10 to 20 years? Are we going to be testing all children at birth? Where are we headed? I do think we're going to be testing all children at birth, and I think we're going to be kicking ourselves that we didn't do it sooner. Uh, one of the studies that we've done most recently, we call the BabySeq Project, and it's the first randomized trial to sequence healthy newborn babies with a comprehensive genetic uh, DNA test and uh, to give that information back to the parents and to their providers as part and parcel of their medical care. And David, we've, we've had some astounding results. And by that, I mean that even reducing the categories to things that are almost all childhood onset, uh, we have found that 11% of these healthy babies have a dominant DNA mutation that puts them at risk for a rare disease. As Gemma said at the very beginning of this uh, podcast, rare disease is not rare in the aggregate. 90% of these babies are carrying a recessive variant that will someday be important to them when they are having children of their own. 80% of these babies are carrying a pharmacogenomic variant that is uh, atypical for at least one category of medication. And 5 to 10% of these babies are within the tail end of the distribution curve on at least one of six polygenic risk scores. 
So there is a lot of salient health information that I think families want to know about their babies and human beings are going to want to know about themselves and that we're going to want our providers to know about us in order to preserve our health. Wow. Saskia, where do you think we're going to be? I also think that uh, genetic testing, genome sequencing being offered to everyone is coming in the next decade or two. I think we have a huge amount of work to do to understand the consequences of that, the implications of that, the societal implications of that, the personal implications of that. The, how The insurance? Insurance is a serious consideration. The um, right not to know um, for children and young people. One of the things we need to remember is that genome sequencing is a, a resource, not a test. So that DNA sequence can sit there. Um, and it's it's only once you analyze and interpret it that it becomes something meaningful to you, to your doctor and so on. So it may be that you interrogate it in different ways. For a baby, you do one thing. At 16, you offer something different, but they have to, and a young person has to be able to make an informed choice. Is this the right time for them? At 30, you offer something different. So I think this is coming. I think one of the big things that we're going to need to do a lot of work on is how we communicate with people complexity and uncertainty. We've talked a lot about communicating risk. We've talked less about how you communicate the uncertainty around that. That is going to be huge um, in in genetics. And, and, and that's because there will be things you observe, these variants, where you just don't know actually right. what their significance is. Well, and because if you're combining uh, 500,000 oh, common genetic variants, right, the uncertainty, you, yes. You don't know what the risk is. The uncertainty around each of big, the uncertainty around each of those 500,000 variants is very different to the uncertainty around a single rare genetic variant. Gemma, where are we going to be? Well, isn't it always the case that people say you, you overestimate where you're going to be in five years and underestimate where you're going to be in 20 years? So I note that you asked about in 20 years' time. So I, I think it's it's probably um, very safe to say that there's going to be a lot more um, genomic testing um, um, taking place within healthcare. I think, you know, what's really important about that is that we do it in the right way. Um, you know, that the public trust is maintained. Um, communication, of course, is key to that and engaging with our users about what testing we want to happen in our, within our society, within our healthcare system is really, really uh, um, key and important. Um, of course, it's not just about genomic testing. We're talking about that a lot because the testing technology has come down in price and we can do it now. You have to, you know, especially within the UK where we have a healthcare system model, it's not just about testing. It's about putting the the rest of the healthcare system um, in support of the the results of that testing. Because if that's not in place, then what's the point of doing the testing at all? So I, th I think that we have to make sure that we can utilize the results of those tests appropriately, um, and that we implement th this technology in our healthcare system in a fair way. So when we think about things like polygenic risk scores, you know, this we we know that these are much more predictive in the Caucasian population than they are in the non-Caucasian population. So I think it's a real challenge. To us to do something about that um, and that requires a lot more data from um, traditionally underserved communities be in our data models um, so we need to think about how to do this how to do it well how to do it with public trust with public partnership um, and, and in a fair in a fair way in order that we can utilize this technology and get the, the promise from this technology in order to improve health for everyone well with those uh, uh, bracing extraordinary visions of the future of medicine in mind, uh, it's time for me to say a, a really deep thank you to my guests, Robert Green in Boston, Gemma Chandratilaka in Cambridge, and Saskia Sanderson from London, and Gillian Hastings Ward from the 100,000 Genomes Project. And it's goodbye from me and the Risky Talk team. Risky Talk is produced by Elan Goodman at the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication in the University of Cambridge. Mm -hmm.